this is the Christian Circle Podcast and you're listening to Pamela Fernandez, where we have conversations about Christian living. Here's the show. Welcome to a new episode of the Christian Circle Podcast and today we have a new guest, Dr. John Bruchowski and he's going to talk to us about the pro-life movement. And before we get into all of this, um, Dr. John, tell us a little bit about yourself and your ministry. I'm a 61-year-old uh, gynecologist. Uh, for about the last 30 plus years. I grew up in a great family in Northern New Jersey. I'm married of close to over 30 years now. I have two sons and a granddaughter, uh, which is marvelous. Growing up, uh, I grew up in a somewhat of a religious family, but I then lost my way and believed that, uh, that uh, fertility was a curse. Uh, hormones were something to be repressed. Babies were a sexually transmitted disease. And so being a good doctor, uh, I learned how to end the life of babies in their mother's womb. I also was at a contraceptive research and development center, and I learned about IUDs and birth control pills and sterilizations and many other means of uh, overriding a woman's hormones and just suppressing them with other hormones. Um, and then because of, uh, I don't know, because of the data that was coming in through medical journals and um, through experiments and through articles that I was reading, plus so many people who were praying for conversion of, on this issue of abortion, um, I came face to face with um, uh, the world of the supernatural of our Lord and uh, our Blessed Mother. Um, and I had a change of heart, immediately um, came off a hill and came back to my medical training and said, I can't do this anymore. And ever since, uh, trying to put my money where my mouth was uh, to care for women, body, soul, and spirit, holistically integrated together, and never pit mom against baby. Never, never do that because it's not good for the baby. It's never good for the baby, and many times it's not good for the mom. And so now uh, I run a practice, but with, I run it with five other doctors. I don't do this alone. We educate residents and medical students and nurses and nurse practitioners and PAs from across the country and throughout the world. They've come here. And now um, I, we started Tepiac OBGYN in Fairfax, Virginia. And uh, we probably do five to 600 deliveries a year. Uh, we see probably 12, 13,000 patient visits. People come from all over to, um, hear, you know, to come for the care that we provide in what is termed uh, life-affirming medicine. And so um, we are a not-for-profit, so we actually see the underserved. And uh, Divine Mercy Care is the kind of the umbrella uh, to help uh, our medical practice serve and educate our patients and, uh, and our peers. So where exactly was your conversion experience? Uh, I believe you've, you've been to various places, Guadalupe and all the Holy Shrines. Yeah. So where was your where was your conversion experience? So I'm sure it began when my mom and dad would take us on trips when we were little. I believe my mom and dad uh, dedicated me to our Lord, the Sacred and Immaculate Heart, when I was a baby. But uh, it wasn't until college, when I went to Guadalupe, that I heard something tangible, very audible, very direct. Why are you hurting me? Mm -hmm. And then a few years later. I was on a hill in Medjugorje, going there against my will, basically, with my mother, of all people. <laughs> um, and uh, my whole world came crashing down. Mm -hmm. um, I, in fact, uh, it was in the middle of the winter, I think, of 1990. And one of the people that were with me, uh, Pamela, was a young Filipino man from Florida. Mm -hmm. And his simplicity, his humility, his total prayer life truly affected me. And I was uh, in a wonderful evangelical church at the time, but I left that hill in Medjugorje, just a totally different human being. And I came home and I told my doctors that I could no longer abort babies and provide these hormones. I really needed to cooperate with a woman's body and really, um, talk about getting to the root of disease and getting to the root of problems. And that by doing good science, we can understand our fertility and we can help make abortion unwanted and children welcome. And that was the big deal. 
but yeah, that happened in 1990, and we've been working here at Tepiac since 1994. Your testimony actually um, highlights the role of a mother's intercession in a child's life, right? That uh, through a mother's prayers, through everything that she does, her focus is entirely on her baby, on her, on her kid. Amen. Uh, this whole idea of do whatever he tells you, this idea of um, one of the last lines that Jesus Christ does in scripture in John 19, he gives his mother away to us. He gives his, his beloved to his mother because the mother is always some of the most wonderful people were the moms in my practice mm -hmm. who fought for their baby's worth and life even when their baby was sick. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that when, when love overcomes all, I have seen it firsthand through my patients, even those who may at first have fought it, mm -hmm. even those who may at first wanted to terminate, but there are so many of good women out there who, despite what the data shows, despite the severity of the illness, despite the difficulty of the circumstance, a mother and child, that bond, is incredibly special. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, Miss Pamela, you are spot on. And I know in the culture of uh, the Filipinos and the Polish people in both of our families, my God, family is so crucial. And mothers are especially special and honored. I think in the world today, we think motherhood is second class. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of garbage. <laughs> These are the women that are forming uh, the sons and daughters for the people that are going to help stand up to the injustice and to really make a difference in the world today. So for the people who, who are unaware, what exactly is the pro-life movement? The pro-life movement is that you don't destroy life to save life. I don't get rid, I don't destroy, I don't get rid of poverty by killing women, poor, poor fetuses, poor babies of poor women. You don't do that. What you do is, you know, I heard this in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. That's the line from John. Yeah. One of my professors taught me in the beginning is the code and the code is human and the code tells you that it's human life. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that when I say life begins at fertilization, mm -hmm. the genetic code mm -hmm. of a new individual. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, we can do 23 and me. I can do ancestry on a one cell embryo and I can predict the future of that embryo in many cases. Mm -hmm. Maybe not to the, the maybe not to the fact, but I can tell whether there's going to be diabetes, where there may be hypertension, where there might be cancer. Mm -hmm. And so once you realize that human life begins at fertilization, or the old word is conception, mm -hmm. then you care for the least of our brothers and sisters. And that one cell human is probably the least of the least of the least. <laughs> and so pro-life movement medicine is about helping those little innocent lives. But it's also building on the data that says that abortion and all of these interventions cause depression, uh, addiction, uh, breast cancer, uh, preterm labor. I'm just going down the list. Yeah. And it's good for both the baby, the woman, and the family. Mm -hmm. You don't fix family problems by getting rid of a family member. You just don't do that. And so that's what the pro-life movement is about. It's much more than the baby. It's not just about empowerment. It's really about sacrifice and what real love is. Mm -hmm. So I think it's win, 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 win everywhere. So can you explain what really happens in an abortion and what happens in contraception? And how do both these contribute to the death of a human being? So, you know, it, it, that's a loaded question, but with an abortion, you murder a baby at close terms. If you do a surgical abortion, the doctor is only about seven to eight inches away from the death of that child. Mm -hmm. So it's hand-to-hand -hand combat with a child, a person, a human life that's much smaller and weaker than you. Mm -hmm. When they get bigger, they fight back. And it brutalizes and torments the actual provider of the abortion. That's why there's not more doctors doing them. Mm -hmm. So in an abortion, it's the ending of a human life. Mm -hmm. We call it the ending of a pregnancy, mm -hmm. the termination. But in reality, it's the taking of a human life, period. 
contraception is basically saying, well, if the abortion, if if my other contraception fails, I can get rid of the life after it's here. Mm -hmm. Contra means trying to prevent it. Mm -hmm. Exception means life. But as we know, 90% of all abortions are done for convenience purposes. Mm -hmm. So contraception is when you consciously say, uh, I, I don't want, I don't need a pregnancy right now. I want to have sex. I want to have sex with maybe someone that's not my partner. Maybe that's not even my family member. Maybe that's not my husband or wife. There's no long-term commitment. Well, the reality of sex, of intimacy, is both love and life. And that's why contraception really disrupts that. It flips the problem and saying, well, you can have one but without the other. Well, contraception is always about suppressing fertility, destroying tubal, destroying anatomy. And so I know a lot of people that they don't seem to have any negative effects from it. But there are a whole host of women out there who have suffered incredible difficulties. Just think about birth control pills and breast cancer, birth control pills and blood clots. That's the one that's been on TV lately. Think about the IUDs that are being pulled off the market. Think about the uh, different injections that have been only relegated to giving, being given to poor people. Once again, a lot of times they talk about that contraception like a pill or, or an IUD. It prevents implantation of the developing human. A birth control pill tries to prevent ovulation, but because we lower the dose to decrease side effects, we think that there's, you know, there's a, an escape ovulation about 13% of the time. And when that escape ovulation occurs, you may have a fertilization. It's the arrogance of saying, well, I don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. It might happen one in 10,000 cases. It's not, well, wait a second. Mm -hmm. we, just, we just don't think that way. And we encourage others not to think that way also. Mm -hmm. And there's a wonderful book out there called Everything Below the Waist, written by a wonderful feminist who actually talks about the incredible audacity of doctors putting women on hormones mm -hmm. and wrecking their fertility, wrecking their physiology. And this is from a feminist who's pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. So I really think it's catching on because it takes about 30, 40, 50 years. And that's what's happening. But thanks for the question. So what would you say to Christians and Catholics who claim to be a pro-choice? Some of them claim that life begins nowhere at fertilization. Some claim that this is a life-saving procedure. So what do you say to these Christians? How do you convince them? Or what do you tell them to make them see the light? Which uh, we, yeah, cannot do when God can, but but No, you I understand. No, Pamela, you're this is um once again, I really love your podcast. I love the way you explore these issues. I'm so grateful to be here today. Um in scripture, children are considered gifts from God. Nowhere are they considered um, a burden. And so therefore, if you're a Christian and you claim to be pro-choice and you believe in a woman's right to choose an, a termination, an abortion, where the hell is that in scripture? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the number one issue is children are gifts from God, period. They're not sexually transmitted diseases. They're not a side product of a fling you can still have great sex. You can still understand your fertility with the natural fertility awareness-based methods between a good communication, but that's one thing. The claimants that life begins nowhere at fertilization, with all due respect, biology, embryology, biochemistry, all point to fertilization. Now, it may not look like a human and it may not have consciousness, but neither does a lot of people who are human. Mm -hmm. In fact, we are a member of a family that is genetically united. So when we say the Our Father, we're mm -hmm. talking about all of us. Mm -hmm. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We just, once again, we can't convert anybody with arguments, ma'am. Mm -hmm. We have to do it. The Holy Spirit does the hard work. Mm -hmm. What we do is we talk it like this. And then we put our money where our mouth is and we show them that we will love them and walk with them through wherever they are. Mm -hmm. I can't tell them to have an abortion. I can't even go and help them have one. But if they do have one, they're welcome back to see us at our practice because we don't judge at all. 
you love them through it. And you show them that there is a deeper resonance of honesty, truth, beauty, justice behind giving your child life. I think trying to pit a mom against its baby is incredibly barbaric. And that's what these do. The contraceptive says, I don't want the child right now, but uh, I guess if I take, I'll take it if it's forced on me. No child wants to hear that. Or maybe I should have aborted you. No child likes to hear that. And of course, the silence or the joy of eternity um, after the abortion, the child only hears the suction machine or the breaking of the water before it dies. I mean, I, it's barbaric. But uh, people, that, that's, where our, that's where our world is today. I have a friend who's actually over 70 and she's a breast cancer survivor. And every Saturday morning, she will go to the abortion center and pick it outside and talk to the women and talk to the staff and try to convince people. And her thing is that the other side of the story is the staff, you know, the people who contribute to this culture. So how can doctors actually fight back and, you know, manage these, especially with new laws coming in New York now that are being tabled in government. They're saying meet here, meet there, Catholic doctors are gathering together. But how do you take a stand and say no? How do you fight back this peer pressure that doctors are experiencing? Wow. <laughs> I tell you, Pamela, you don't, uh, you really go after the heart of the issue. Um, we do it by example. Once again, um, laws are one thing. I think when you realize that there are many people like you out there or a few people out there like you, I think that you realize that you're not alone. That's the first thing. The second piece is you, whatever you do in life, whether if you're, um, if you're a teacher and the topic is brought up, speaking up in a loving, gentle way of pointing out the obvious, you don't try to condemn. You don't try to use trick arguments. You literally pose the question back to them. Are you really saying that the way to end poverty is to kill babies from poor people? Like that's kind of a, an empty approach. I and mean, that's a failure of total government. That's a failure of total society. If you can't figure out a way to help and care and give them the tools they need to get out of poverty. and so. As a doctor in OBGYN, I've part, you know, I opened my doors to all the pregnancy centers in the area. We've also opened our doors to all the abortion centers in our, in our area. If they have a patient who just can't go through with it, send them to us. That's why Divine Mercy Care, our sister mother organization, Tepiak OBGYN is an OBGYN practice. Five doctors, one midwife. We do OBGYN. We do it cooperatively and collaboratively. We listen to women. We don't just dump hormones into their body for the heck of it. We try to figure out the root causes. When it comes to the underserved, Divine Mercy Care helps us raise money by begging. Begging is becoming. We go out and for people who want to provide care, we also provide education because we don't want them to keep making the same difficult choices over and over and over again. And so it's a matter of loving people through the difficulties. And we're not gonna fix these problems. The poor are gonna be with us all the time. But in our little community, Pamela, we serve those who come to us, that's it. And when we go give talks across the country and across the world, we tell them they can do the same thing in their own communities. And you do it one heart at a time. That's when we talk about transforming hearts through healthcare. That's what I would say. It's nothing fancy and it's nothing sexy. And yes, you know, these laws are coming into play, but they're just laws. And, you know, God knows in order to make children welcomed and abortion unwanted, you need more than laws. You need love. So I'm in family practice and I know that a lot of physicians are, are giving away, you know, contraceptives willy nilly here and there. And they will lose patients if they don't do it. So most of them are dealing with this, this in their heart that they know that it is wrong. So how do you deal with the aftermath of past actions where you know you've done something that is counter to what God <laughs> called you to do? Oh, 
Um, it's only the mercy of Jesus Christ, right, Pam? Yeah. It's only, when you talk about Christian circle podcasts, um, the Christian circle is the Lord died for us. Mm -hmm. We are now his family through choosing him as a good evangelical, of claiming him as Lord and Savior or through baptism. It gives us new life. And then we have to cooperate with him and his work just like Colossians 1 24 talks about, but it's only when you can forgive yourself through the grace and power of Jesus Christ. Um, I have to tell you that um, I think one of the reasons why Jesus gave us his mother on that hill on that Friday afternoon was that she must have thought for a moment that she was a failure watching her son. And yet, his promise was that he would rise again, mm -hmm. and she got him to that point. And so what I want to tell your friends and people out there in the podcast is talk to people like us, me. Mm -hmm. You know, we're happy to answer and work with and talk to you about what's real and what's not or what you're dealing with. There's no judgment. I also believe that our, if you're in New York City, Pam, are you in New York City? I was, and I, I just came to India right now. I got stuck during COVID. So. Oh, my God. Okay, so New York City has the most contraception yes. per square block yeah. than any city in the Western Hemisphere. Yeah. Any city. And guess what? They abort more babies in New York City. So it has nothing to do with the amount of contraception just remember that mm -hmm. because look at look at new york city more contraception does not equal lower abortion rates mm -hmm. it may in some cases but the damage done to a woman's fertility or the disregard for it maybe it's not the damage maybe it's just that i can manipulate it i can do this mm -hmm. more and more women are realizing that depression sadness anxiety hair loss weight gain headaches are real and they deserve better than that. And so the science behind what people used to talk about Catholic roulette, NFP, mm -hmm. which is now fertility awareness, mm -hmm. it's coming to the 22nd century. Yeah. There's five or six different methods. You can talk to people about it and they can come to understand it. Mm -hmm. And you actually can see the connection between your actions and your childbearing mm -hmm. or your lovemaking or the love of, you know, once again, the best way to have mind-blowing orgasms is to be more natural and cooperative with someone that you love. Mm. These days, I hope the days of uh, one night stands and, you know, but it's just human nature. You meet people where they're at. Those who can listen will listen. Those who can't, they won't. But as long as you, you know, love them and, you know, work with them, it is what it is. So what, what else, Pam? What can, what can ordinary people do to help the pro-life movement, to help you, to help your organization, to help all those people who are, who are working for women in these circumstances? So as Mark 9 says, some of these things you can only get rid of through prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Number two is when you find an organization that you really think makes a difference, like Tepeyac OBGYN or mm -hmm. Divine Mercy Care, contribute to them financially. Mm -hmm. pray for them directly, mm -hmm. call them up and say, hey, what can we do to help you? Mm -hmm. Can we bring you here to this area? Mm -hmm. That's one way. The other way is go into your own community and give of your time, give of your experience to pregnancy centers, mm -hmm. to, um, to organizations that try to educate women, uh, whether it's in a church or whether it's in a... Um, kind of a federal program, mm -hmm. give of yourself and then be authentic with it. Mm -hmm. When you look at somebody, look them in the eye and let your eyes do the talking that they're loved, they're welcomed mm -hmm. and nothing is off the table. Nothing can push you away from me and you're worth something. And I really believe um, that's what makes a difference. So one is prayer and fasting. Two is contribute. If you think Tepiak OBGYN is something, Look us up, tepiakobgyn.com or divinemercycare.org. Please, please, or a good group in your own community. Mm -hmm. And just a little bit, whether it's five cents or $5,000, all of it will be put to good use. 
and then you volunteer your time and uh, you really uh, will make a difference. So do you have any last pieces of advice for the women and the men and the staff and everyone who's part of the abortion process, part of the contraception culture, part of the death culture in general? So <laughs> there's an old line that when mothers aren't happy, the family's not happy. Mm -hmm. Women demand better. Mm -hmm. They demand to be listened to, to be accompanied. They demand to be given real options that build up their body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. They're not mother-making machines. They're not um, high-priced call girls who are bodies are being used every week. They're also not meant to just be a corporate lemming on the corporate ladder. I fully believe that women demand and deserve better. When you have a sick child, don't end its life. Spend as much time as you can with it because that baby is going to pass away sooner than you think. Mm -hmm. So a perinatal hospice is a good option. Mm -hmm. If it, some doctor is telling you to put something in your uterus to stop something, wait a second, isn't there a better way to do it than just treating me like a camel and putting something, you know, what they used to put coconuts up the uteruses, crossing the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think that by conversation and empowering women about their own physiology, that feminine genius can come through and um, they can realize that they just deserve and demand better uh, from us, from their partners. And uh, ultimately, uh, the only way that they can forgive themselves mercifully is to resume a conversation or a listening session with the Almighty One, with Jesus Christ. And for many of us who also appreciate what Jesus and God did to the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Remember, it was only them that made her who she was. I really want them to know that uh, anybody who has gone to Jesus or Mary has never been let down. And it's through podcasts like yours, uh, Dr. Pamela, that I am just uh, grateful. Uh, what you're doing for the good of the world and society uh, with this podcast is incredibly blessed. And I pray abundance upon you and your peeps. Thank you so much, Dr. John. And uh, if people want to get in touch with you, they want to uh, help out with your work, where can they find you and uh, online or on social media or wherever you are? Yeah, so both of the, so it's Tepeyac for the Catholics in the audience. It's the hill in Guadalupe. So it's T-E-P-E-Y-A-C-O-B-G-Y-N, five letters, dot com. And then the other organization that also shows what we're trying to do and what we have done for the last uh, 20 years plus, Divine Mercy Care, D-I-V-I-N-E-M-E-R-C-Y-C-A-R-E dot -E org. And, you know, we're more than happy to continue this conversation there uh, because I really think that that's, we just want to share the blessing that we've had. So thank you so much for joining us on this podcast and uh, taking the time to tell us all about, you know, your life, your ministry and sharing all this information, because there are a lot of people who are scared to talk about this, uh, you know, on, on this platform. So I'm so, so grateful for you and for Kathy and for all your, your team for, for, you know, organizing this and, and going ahead with this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pamela. God bless.